Today we're going to be talking about the facts and the murder of Matthew Shepard, a 21-year-old college student who was murdered in a hate crime in 1998. If you guys did not get a chance to watch it yet, please check out right here the life of Matthew Shepard in this three-part series about the life, the murder, and the legacy of Matthew Shepard. As a disclaimer, there's graphic content in this video, so let's get into it. As you know, Matthew Shepard was a college student in Laramie, Wyoming at the University of Wyoming when he was murdered. Just prior to this incident, his suicidal tendencies really kind of took a turn for the worse. One of his really good friends in college was this girl named Tina, and she was married. She was an anthropology major, and they just kind of protected each other. Matthew was clinically depressed. He had been in and out of the hospital because of some incidents in his life and having to deal with his homosexuality and for many other reasons that clinical depression exists. He was on two medications, Effexor, which is an antidepressant, and Clonopin, which is actually an antipsychotic, but it's used to treat anxiety. He was about a month into his semester he was having financial difficulties just like any other college student. Friday, October 2nd, 1998, Tina and Matthew went to Fort Collins, Colorado to a gay bar called Tornado. They kind of splurged, they took a limo there. It was kind of a place known for people being HIV positive and not disclosing it. On their drive home, actually, in the limo, he disclosed to Tina that he actually had a full plan for how he was gonna kill himself, basically overdosing on clonopin and drinking a bunch of alcohol. He was kind of already on that path, so she got concerned. So Saturday comes, Tina was kind of coming down with cold, I think her husband was too. She left Matthew at her apartment, to sleep on the couch and when he woke up she asked is he really gonna be okay is he gonna hurt himself or is he really gonna be okay and he says at his core he's fine so she goes away and she doesn't hear from him till Sunday she comes back to her apartment he's gone she hadn't heard from him she went to his apartment to look for him she goes downtown searching for him on that Sunday which is October 4th and she finds him alone at a restaurant and we had also on Saturday when he was at her apartment had a fight with his mother and the fight was about how he had overdrawn his account on Sunday he apologized apologizes to his mother. They say they love each other and that was the last time his mother Judy Shepard heard from him. Tina hadn't talked to him but it was kind of normal that they didn't go a couple days without talking but he had mentioned this suicide plan so she on Tuesday after not hearing from him kind of is freaking out and by Wednesday night she calls the police. Prior to this on October 6th Matthew was supposed to go see a movie with his friend. It was his birthday. They were gonna meet at 6 30 and then Matthew cancels. The queer society that he was in in, in the University of Wyoming, LGBTA it was called, had a meeting. So that night, instead of going to see the movie with his friend, he went to this meeting. And they were preparing for the following Monday, the beginning of Gay Awareness Week. His friends go to the Village Inn afterwards and he has like cherry pie and he's trying to convince everybody to go to this lounge. Nobody wants to go. So his friend Kim Nash drops him off at home and that's the last time she ever sees him again. Matthew ends up going by himself to the Fireside Lounge. He shows up there around 10.30. Nobody knows why exactly he went to this bar. It was karaoke night. It was something he wasn't really into. We're switching locations right now because that water was driving me crazy. So Matthew shows up at the Fireside Lounge. He sits at the bar. He talks to the bartender. He's very sociable and approachable and he loves talking to people. And he has a Heineken and a mixed drink probably some clonopin in him. Shortly thereafter, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson arrive. They come at about 11.45, they buy a really cheap pitcher of beer. That's when they see Matthew by himself. There's a lot of speculation about what was actually said, what the encounter actually was about, if they were meeting each other for the first time. But the overarching theme is that initially, aside from the fact that Matthew was gay, they wanted to rob him and possibly teach him a lesson, hence the hate crime. They meet up, they exchange a few words, they follow him into the bathroom, and somehow all three of them leave. A lot of Matthew's friends are confident that Matthew wouldn't have been interested in those two sexually. One thing that's noteworthy to mention is that in Laramie it's pretty common at least in 1998 to get rides with people if you needed to go somewhere. This is way before Uber. And his mother implies that Matthew actually liked being friends with all types of people so he might have really just wanted to make new friends. What ensues afterwards is Matthew's murder. I want to go back really quickly and just mention about these two, Aaron and Russell. I don't want to give them too much airtime, but it is worth kind of giving a little bit about their background. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were just 
bad news. They'd broken a bunch of laws. Aaron McKinney grew up as pretty much a rebel. He had gotten in a lot of trouble in school. When he was 16, he dropped out to work. His mother had died earlier and he had an inheritance and he splurged all of that money. And this is about the time that he met Kristen Price. Kristen and Aaron had a trailer together. At one point, Aaron had committed a robbery and he fled to Florida and he got caught. So he was dealing with that case. Um, and was on probation at this time. Russell, whose girlfriend was Chastity at the time, and these girls were complicit in the murder. Russell was a good kid growing up up until a certain point, and then he got heavily involved in drugs, and it all just kind of went downhill from there. Russell's mother had just died earlier that year, so he was pretty broken up about it. Needless to say, this was kind of a perfect storm of these two being friendly together. Both of their mothers had died. I think Russell's stepfathers or her mother's boyfriends had beat the crap out of him his whole life, and I'm pretty sure the same thing happened with Aaron, who went on massive crystal meth binges together. And they were selling and involved in a lot of theft. Back to Matthew, Aaron, and Russell leaving the bar together. Judy's Shepherd, Matthew's mom, has the counterphobia argument that Matthew just liked to make friends with all types of people. He would have made an incredible politician. On Matthew's way out, the DJ there, I think his name was Shadow, gave Matthew his last cigarette. And that was the last time anybody besides Russell and Aaron had seen Matthew. This is where the waters get a little muddy, but they drove about a mile east and passed a Walmart and went down a really dark, abandoned road until it became a dead end. Apparently in the car ride that is when they attempted to rob Matthew and Matthew willingly gave over his wallet and there was only $20 in it. In the deposition afterwards Aaron said that Matthew had put his hand on his leg and it pissed him off so much that he wanted to beat him up. Whether or not that is true and I don't think it is because Matthew was very shy about sexuality. He really just wanted friends and even if he was messed up they either lured him into a situation where he would have thought that was okay or it just didn't happen. At the end of this dead end road is a wooden buck fence. They throw Matthew to the ground outside of the car and they bind his hands and they tie them to the fence. So Russell is tying his hands mostly with a clothesline and Aaron proceeds to steal his patent leather shoes and the idea is that they were gonna beat him up and then they were gonna kind of leave him there so it would have been difficult for him to walk home if he hadn't had his shoes. So he wasn't gonna go home anytime soon. One of the things that is said as to why they were tying him up and about to beat him is because Matthew had seen their license plate after they had robbed him and they thought he was gonna tell on him. So they took his shoes and they wanted to kind of silence him. Aaron then proceeds to pistol whip Matthew. People use this as a tactic in case bullets run out, but you can still use your gun as a weapon. So this is a 375 Magnum Smith & Wesson revolver, and Aaron beats him with the back of this huge revolver, the butt of the revolver, over his head 19 to 21 times. As this is happening, Russell is standing behind Aaron, and he's apparently laughing the entire time. Now these two have been on a huge bender, I think it was about four days of no sleep and tons of crystal meth use. Maybe they were coming down, maybe Matthew knew where to get some, who knows why they were in this situation. Or maybe they just assumed that a gay guy would know where to get meth. Either way, they were definitely not in their right mind and they were probably fiending. After pistol whipping him, they tortured Matthew and it's said that in certain reports that I read that they tried to light him on fire, but needless to say, they took the shoes, they had his wallet, they took the gun, obviously, and they left him there in near freezing temperatures. Matthew remained bound to this fence for 18 hours. At the 18 hour mark, a cyclist rode by and thought that Matthew actually was a scarecrow and soon realized that it was not after he saw the blood. The first officer on the site was policewoman Reggie Flutie. Matthew was on his back with his hands still tied behind him and his respirations were far and few between. Officer Flutie attempted to open Matthew's mouth to let the air in, but she could not open his jaw. She ended up having to take AZT treatments at the time after the fact because she didn't have any gloves on her but she still nobly tried to open Matthew's mouth and got some of his blood on her bare skin. While Matthew was in the hospital it was discovered even by his parents at the time that he was HIV positive. His brainstem had been crushed which controls your vital functions. He had four major fractures on his skull. His face was covered with blood but there were two streams where tears had cleared a pathway from the blood down his face. About 16 hours 
earlier, Aaron and Russell had left Matthew there, gotten in another scuffle, and ended up leaving a lot of evidence behind because of that scuffle, which is how police immediately connected them to Matthew's murder. They went home to their girlfriends and tried to make them alibis because they knew they had done something really bad with Matthew. They left their truck behind where the scuffle ensued. Obviously, Matthew's credit card was in the car, his shoes, and the gun that was used to pistol whip Matthew with blood on the butt. Matthew had been in a coma for 18 hours the entire time he was there, tied up to the fence, but there was an interview that I saw with Judy Shepard and Ellen, and she said, when, uh, when Officer Flutie, Reggie Flutie, arrived at the scene to, uh, a mountain biker had actually found him, he'd fallen and found Matt tied to the fence and called 911, and when she arrived on the scene, she saw that there had been a doe, uh, a female deer, sitting um, in the bushes off to the side. She'd been nesting there, apparently through the night, uh, next to Matt. And when she drove up, the doe ran off. So it, it really made us feel better that maybe Matt wasn't alone all that horrible night. Matthew was moved to Fort Collins, Colorado, at a hospital there. He had fractures over the back of his skull. He had one a big one right behind his right ear. He had dozens of lacerations on his face and on his neck. Because of the severity of the injuries, the doctors could not operate. Matthew, at this point, had to be put on life support because his brainstem was so damaged. His parents, upon arriving, recognized him immediately because of the braces that he has. He was hardly recognizable except for that and a couple other marks. At the time of the incident where Matthew was tortured and beaten, his parents actually still were living in Saudi Arabia. So Judy and Dennis Shepard got on a flight. I can't even imagine what that 18 hour or whatever flight was like knowing that your son might be dying in the hospital. I don't think they knew too much actually of what had happened. They just jumped on a plane. His dad was still working for the Saudi oil company as an oil rig inspector. So they jumped on the plane, they came in the hospital, and they stayed with Matthew in the hospital for five days until he passed away on October 12th, 1998 at 12.53 a.m. After this, an entire trial ensued. I will go into much more detail about that in the next video. Both of the men received dual life sentences and there were candlelight vigils, celebrity vigils held after this, and an entire legacy that changed the course of history for the LGBTQ community that Matthew Shepard left behind. One other side note I want to make is that the year before, in 1997, there were 1,400 incidents Incidents that were only reported of LGBTQ people attacked and 21 fatalities from those attacks. But many, many more, especially within the trans community, probably were not reported. So this was endemic already in 1998 and something that needed to be addressed. This murder made national headlines and changed the course of history. Check out the legacy right here, part three of Matthew Shepard.